All right, welcome everybody. The uh, Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. Uh, uh, joining us this morning, we have the fabulous Bob Seiden Schwartz. Bob, how you doing, buddy? Good morning, Peter. Thank you for that just overly generous introduction. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if it's you that brought the fog or the fog just I, followed Look, it's you only or? right here. As you said, it's in your brain. <laughs> it's this part of town that the fog exists coming back down out of the route stake in downtown. Yeah. There is no fog. One, one, of, one of the great things uh, about living in Missoula, of course, is the University of Montana and the various uh, uh, conferences and uh, committees and things that, that gather at the University of Montana. There is a major education conference going on <laughs> at the University uh, of Montana uh, these last couple of days. And we have one of their uh, most distinguished guests here in studio with us this morning. Uh, is that Patty Mag- uh, Dr. Patty McGill-Peterson, right? Correct. All right. So m- may I embarrass you by reading part of your bio? Is that, <laughs> is that okay? Just, just go lightly, please. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Patty McGill-Peterson, a member of the Senior Leadership team at the American Council on Education. ACE is the major coordinating association for higher education institutions in the U.S. As presidential advisor for global initiatives, she oversees the council's work on the internationalization and global engagement of higher education. This includes a broad spectrum of programs and services for U.S. colleges and universities, as well as ACE's outreach to institutions, governments, and associations of higher education around the world. Prior to joining ACE, she was Senior Associate at the Institute for Higher Education Policy. The Institute's mission is to increase access and success in post-secondary education through research and programs that inform key policymakers. Not bad for a cold read. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, write that down there where you're at. All right. And we, we, just, we just want to say thank you for spending time. I know how busy you are this week, and so we appreciate you coming all the way over here on the other side of town to be with us. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, and uh, we're so glad you're following up on this conference. It was a great one and uh, brought a lot of people together around some important topics. Now, now, tell me some of the things that, that happened for those. Uh, one of the nice things about the University of Montana, one of the uh, very convenient and helpful things they did is they streamed many of the conferences that went on, right? And so uh, that, that enabled folks who couldn't actually physically be there, including folks all over the world, to hear what you had to say and Mr. Uh, Mr. Perez and some of the other speakers as well, right? Yeah, and uh, Tom Perez, Secretary of Labor, was terrific. Uh, This is a guy, I don't know if he drinks about 10 cups of coffee before he (laughs) gives a speech, but uh, it was an extremely lively presentation from him. And and also, he came with a deep knowledge of Montana, as I do. I I get my uh, knowledge of Montana from previous visits, but also from my colleague, uh, Paolo, who's with us today. Wonderful. All right, so so tell us a little bit about about, uh, your organization, ACE, and what it is you folks do. We're the Umbrella Higher Education Association in Washington. We represent the interest of everything from community colleges to research one institutions. And I felt right of, at home at the University of Montana because first it's a research one uh, institution, a big university, but also has a community college. And, mm-hmm. you know, it does everything on the spectrum of what you educate for. So we are, are kind of that for a wide a variety of institutions. We have almost 2,000 members, 1,800 institutional members, and other associations belong as well. So our job is really we advocate for higher education. We try to respond when there are questions about where higher education is going. You can imagine that keeps us busy. And we also do a lot of leadership programs, and we have an international mission as well. Even though we're called the American Council on Education, Mm -hmm. these days, it's like your car. The parts are from all over the world. Uh, In higher education, it's really the same. Go ahead, John. Uh, uh, Go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to uh, also bring into the conversation, we have another guest here in the studio, which I want to get this right. I know Paolo is a Gallo Mello. And and Paolo is the head of the international program at the University of Montana, has been a guest on the radio previously, came to Missoula about, is it two years ago now or three years ago? Three years ago. So uh, has done some wonderful things in terms of advancing the program for the university and the city and the state of Montana. So there's a little bit of a backstory here in terms of Patty and uh, um, 
Paulo knowing each other. So if you two would just at least share that, we'll add a little human element uh, to our conversation today. Uh, for, for those of you who can't see us, uh, Paulo has just handed the microphone to me. Uh, but it is, it's, a, it's, an, it's an ice cream relationship. I, I guess I would characterize it this way. And uh, Paul, when I, one of my incarnations uh, was as uh, head of something called the Council for International Exchange of Scholars. And that organization had the responsibility of administering the Fulbright, uh, senior part of the Fulbright program worldwide, Fulbright Scholars Program. And we had 155 bilateral arrangements uh, with countries around the world. And one of them, of course, was Portugal. The head of the Fulbright Commission in Portugal was this guy, Paulo. And uh, we became very good friends because he was one of the outstanding executive directors of the, the commissions around the world. And he and his wife were a wonderful team, Rita, uh, his wife. They both live now here in uh, Missoula. But I found out that they loved American ice cream. We so, still do. Well, you came yeah. to the right place here, didn't you? <laughs> well, wait, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, go ahead. All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I remember when um, when we found out we have uh, we had the same love for ice cream. <laughs> uh, every time I would go to Washington for meetings at CIS, and we'd had I'd have to do this at least twice a year. Um, we actually had a very uh, active uh, Fulbright Scholar program in Portugal at the time, and so every time I'd go to Washington for meetings with Patty in Washington D.C., I'd get to her office, and I'd have in front of me on the on the meeting table, two or three pints of our of my favorite ice cream flavors just for for our meeting, and that was just <laughs> we would amazing. we would go on a Ben and Jerry's run uh, just before Paolo arrived. So I, you know, we had kept up over the years, and Paolo was kind enough to invite me to come to uh, Missoula, and he's he was trying to you know get me out of Washington, and which is a very good idea. And uh, so he said, "All right," he said. I have found the world's best ice cream. And I can now say, I have seen the Big Dipper. I have tasted the Big Dipper. You have the world's best ice cream. What what flavor did you settle on as, uh, as what you thought was the best? Don't you mean flavors? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I've been there twice in okay. three days. Okay. So, uh, I first uh, tried, what was it? It was flat, rosemary, flathead, uh, goat cheese, cherry reduction. Was, yeah, rosemary, rosemary, goat cheese in a flathead cherry reduction. Yeah, oh, okay. The kind of so, thing that you only find fantastic. a big deeper. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, before we go to break, this is the end of the show because this is what global education yeah. is all about. For, for, listen, heck with the funding, just come to the big for, dipper. Forget about and global education. This, this, sounds, this sounds like the great way to make <laughs> peace around the world. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, can imagine, you know, diplomacy <laughs> over ice cream. Yeah, that's it. Who could possibly have a problem with that? How does uh, how does uh, Big Dipper ice cream travel? Does it travel well? Are you able to? Can you take it back home with it, you? Let me put it, it doesn't that way. last long enough to get anywhere, <laughs> from my experience. Well, we we actually had a discussion about that late yesterday. Uh, we after we completed all of our good work on the campus, we took a walk uh, with some uh, one of uh, Paolo's uh, staff member and his uh, wonderful wife Rita. We all went uh, down the street to the Big Dipper and we talked about what whether I could take any home with me and how we would travel. So in the meantime, Paolo goes and gets me a gift card. And this is a this is a symbol of friendship because he says, you know, I'm not buying you airplane tickets. I'm just giving you a gift card to the Big Dipper and I know that you will come back. So <laughs> Well, you how we're but, but work see, it. the nice thing about being uh, who you are, you're so well connected. You can bring a <laughs> lot of heavy duty people with you and say, you know, the University of Montana, that's nice, but this Big Dipper ice yeah, cream. First I, things first. I, I would imagine that would be a great place especially in the summer to hold a conference of some kind, right? Yeah, but you know what intrigues me <clears throat> is I have been told that it's not just the summer that if I came here in February, that I would see a line Absolutely. at the Big Dipper at the appointed time. Is that is mm -hmm. that true? That is true. Yes, and some yeah. of the people would be wearing T-shirts and shorts. 
because mm, it's, it's an Montana. interesting place. It's it's a cross cultural experience. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly is. Well, speaking of cross cultural experience, I wanted to get into the meat and potatoes a little bit and away from the ice cream because we had our dessert first. Clearly, <laughs> um, I wanted to ta- to ask you since both of you are connected both with international affairs and with the college system, a uh, community college and research one schools specifically. I wanted to ask you if you thought that other countries were doing a better job in any aspect of managing their college systems and what sort of things we might be able to learn from these other countries, if in case they are. Do you have about uh, three hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a hard question to ask because, uh, one, number one, the uh, U.S. system is very unique in its size and diversity. We have about 4,200 institutions of higher education. And it's interesting when we do these major uh, international comparisons, uh, we're comparing, if we look at Europe, and, and Paolo can speak to this, but these countries are so much smaller. The size of their institution, the number of institutions for the country is so much smaller. And they serve very different populations. Um, that's changing. If You've all been watching this extraordinary uh, and tragic uh, story of this, the immigrants coming to Europe. Uh, I'd love to hear Paolo talk about this because one of the things we've had to serve and why it's so difficult to say what, you know, what are the similarities, what are the differences, is we have served such a large number of first-generation students. When you think about it, First of all, almost 50% of our students in the United States are being educated in the community college system, 47%. So most of the world does not even have community colleges. This is a very unusual concept. May I ask you why you're in the middle of your thought there? Why do you think America is unique in that way? Is it just the size of our country and the number of people? Or is it something that has to do with the structure of our governance and the way that we've developed the university system or, or what? size of our population has something to do with it, but we have a very unique aspect. Uh, If you read our constitution, it says education shall be left to the states. And so we've had a lot more autonomy for the development of higher education. It hasn't been done through a central ministry. And also we've had such a strong private sector from the beginning. I mean, the fact that the first college, well, Harvard College, um, you have an ex- extraordinarily strong private sector in the United States. And while you have private sector higher education developing around the world, some of it is, is good and some of it is fly-by-night. Uh, so we have a tradition from the beginning of very, very strong private support for higher education. So you've got private higher education developing. You've got all the states trying to do something in their uh, bailiwicks. The system became diverse, and it also got very big very quickly. So, Patty, kind of following that thread, recently Bernie Sanders proposed uh, making college or community colleges, I think is what he said, free. So besides the fact that he didn't explain how it's going to get paid for, (laughs) let's just focus on, you said 50% of the students who attend college go to community colleges. Look at the demographics of the United States over the next 20, 30, 40 years. A lot of the growth is taking place from immigrant uh, growth in this country, first-generation people. So how important is that community college structure in terms of introducing this next generation and second generation of people coming into the United States, our educational system. So is there something in terms of what he's saying that may have some validity to it? I think already you have a large, it's, again, it's about 47% of our students are studying in community colleges. And part of the reason is it is a very low price option right. already right, right now. Um, so, should we make it free? I, I think you'd have to really uh, have a very grassroots town hall discussion about that because community colleges are supported by their local communities. Mm-hmm. And uh, you would need to look at the taxpayers and say, you know, who's going to fit foot this bill? How are we going to do it? Or do we try to keep the price very low and people pay something for higher education? 
One of the things I noticed, and I'd love to hear Paolo talk about this, is we have something called alumni giving to our institutions. Mm-hmm. And it's I was pr- president of two private institutions in the United States, arts and science colleges in the East. And the generosity of our graduates was a very, very important part of our income mm-hmm. stream. This is not a tradition in <laughs> Europe. And I'd love to hear Paolo uh, talk about that if there's a minute. Well, Paolo, one of the things one, uh, Patty wanted to ask you about was uh, uh, the uh, the folks who are migrating into various European countries. I'm sure Portugal is one of them. Uh, how are they dealing with this as it, as, it, as it deals with higher education? Well, the, the first um, stage of um, in, uh, the first large increase in terms of uh, the population of um, students in higher education in, uh, in Europe, uh, especially in the countries that had been dictatorships uh, for most part of the 20th century, like Portugal, Spain, um, Greece. Um, these were countries um, that only saw a huge uh, increase in the number of um, of students as those dictatorships ended in the late 20th century. And so education, public education be- become, public became education, more available, right? Exactly, okay. and education uh, itself became an important, uh, an important thing. And so by then you only had uh, public universities or mostly public universities. The very few uh, uh, private universities were um, Catholic universities in most of Europe. Um, Jesuit universities, a very good uh, education, quality of education actually. But you didn't have other private universities. Um, and so that started only in the late 90s and late uh, 70s, 80s, and then 90s. And in the 90s, that's when also the migration um, um, increased or helped increasing numbers of students in those countries. And um, that's when you saw private universities appearing everywhere in Europe mm-hmm. to actually, to because the private sector is usually quicker in responding to right, those right. needs uh, than government. I'm, I'm sure and the wheels of government grind slowly all over the world, they, right? Exactly. And <laughs> okay. so that's when you saw p- private universities uh, stepping up everywhere. And, and for instance, just in Portugal, all of a sudden you had, within maybe five to ten years, you had ten or fifteen pub- uh, private universities uh, appearing out of the blue just Paolo, in who, a few who, years. Who started or funded those private universities in a country uh, like Portugal? Uh, they started with some, some with some companies behind it, yeah. um, um, but they were making money right away uh, with a very, with degrees that are not um, investment intensive, like um, you know the paper and pencil degrees as we call them in Europe, and that are very popular in terms of um, uh, numbers of students, uh, such as um, law all the humanities, social sciences, and those are were the, the degrees that you saw first uh, appearing in those private universities. You didn't see med- private medical schools <laughs> appearing out of the blue or colleges of engineering appearing out of the blue in, in private universities. So, John, you have a Facebook question. Yeah, we got a question from Katie. She wants to know, uh, is one of the topics that you address, uh, does it deal with coordination across countries with regard to curriculum development and standardization of major requirements for professions of all kinds? And how about for testing? That's a great question because it's a big problem. Um, at the American Council on Education, we do not go at this directly, but we have a, a unit within our organization that deals with cred- credentialing. So the issue of you know how you credential similar kinds of education and have it recognized across borders as the same thing is uh, an issue for us. It's tenacious because every institution develops its own coursework. It decides what it is you have to have for the degree. And that's why, um, and Paolo knows this well, the Europeans, when the EU came about, there was something called the uh, Erasmus and Bologna, mainly the Bologna movement, where the, the whole goal was to make sure that all the European countries in the European Union were coordinating their degree systems so that if I got a degree in chemistry in Portugal and I moved to Sweden, my degree would be recognized or if I was a chiropractor 
and I got a degree in Sweden and went to Italy, it would be uh, recognized. So in this respect, I think the Europeans are probably the model. Uh, I don't know how Paolo feels about it, but my sense is they're the model. Now we have, and will increasingly have, a globally mobile workforce. This is going to get larger and larger because the work workers will go where the work is, and also workers are going to find whole new industries, whole new ways of working. This is going to happen in different parts of the world, and there will be magnets for or the workforce. So having a way for workers to and employees of different kinds of companies move from place to place and having their degree recognized is – your, your Facebook uh, question is a really good one. We are working on parts of it, but there's not a coordinating agency here that is global to take care of all of this. Be- because th- there is, there is uh, uh, an attitude out there uh, in the general public that, that, that thinks that there is some gigantic you know, controlling organization that's handling, that, that's basically giving dictums to, to every school all over the world. It, but obviously there isn't, according to what you just said. No, and that's, that's the whole idea right now. You have, remember, it, when Woodrow Wilson tried to get the League of Nations going, it was a very controversial issue. The whole idea, first of all, our national governance is always controversial. <laughs> if you move, uh, and nations are uh, tenacious about their sovereignty. Uh, think about the whole global warming issue. Uh, when nations go to those big summits. Which is coming up here very in December, soon, and it's going to be very soon. Very interesting. And so it, it's a, a dynamic where you have national goals and national wishes being put up against what's the best thing for the globe. And global warming and environmental degradation is probably one of the best examples I can think of. But this issue of worker mobility, of uh, uh, people being able to take their whatever their degrees and their knowledge is from country to country and, their, and be licensed to do whatever they do, is a big uh, issue. But I think Europe has a, a leg up. I don't know what Paolo Well, thinks. I want to bring Paolo into this conversation here because we have to remember the EU is a big driver behind the standardization, which is not the case here. And... What I've observed over the years is organizations like yourself, the World Affairs Council, any of us that are trying to get information out into the public, we have to do a better job to continue to help people understand the changing dynamics. So when you're talking about global economies changing, that's also a political tool that people use to make a point about, look what's happening to you, the worker. Your jobs are being lost. They're going overseas. So we have this battle constantly within our own country politically that we use this when it's to our advantage, but we're not, and I think, doing a disservice by letting our public and our people know that this world is changing. Regardless of who says what, it is not going back to 1950 and 1960. So, Paulo, go ahead. Well, in, in Europe is, or has been really driving the way in terms of um, uh, standardization of um, university curriculum. And in fact, you can transfer college credits from one country to another. Not only can you transfer your degree, but you can actually take one semester of credits in Portugal and the next semester in France and the next one in, uh, you know, in Germany. And, and, you can, and then you can count all those credits to one degree in one of the countries. Are there any countries that have, that have specifically said, we don't want to be a part of that? In terms of Bo- the Bologna process, it's pretty much widespread. It to, is, okay. All right. All right. Members, and this is uh, a no outliers then, basically. Then. But you can, so you can get college credits, uh, transferable college credits everywhere in Europe, or the European Union, I should say. Um, and, and you can uh, apply, being a citizen of one of the EU member countries, you can go and apply for a job at any other EU member country. Mm-hmm. What you cannot transfer is your professional certification. If you're, for instance, I have a daughter who is a physical therapist. She did her degree in physical therapy in England. She's a certified physical therapist in England. It took her one year to get the same kind of certification in Portugal, just, you know, just submitting paperwork and more paperwork. And, but she was able to finally get the degree, get the professional certification in Portugal. So she could work. 
So she could work, right. can work as a physical therapist in England or in Portugal. She moved here. She asked for the same kind of certification, and she actually um, would have to go back to high school <laughs> oh and do four or five high school courses. Wow. And then I don't know how many college courses and to finally get the same kind of certification. So, But professional associations are you know, are meant to be protective of their own profession. Mm -hmm. Let's continue on. So, Bob, go ahead. Uh, I, can I get a little clarification, too? Uh, Paul, you are the director. Are you not of the International Studies Program, or am I mistaken? I'm an associate provost for Global Center Education. Okay. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So this all fits very well within the purview of what, what you were doing in terms of holding this conference, in terms of bringing students here to the university, because that's one of your jobs, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, to supervise all uh, internationalization efforts at the university, including internationalizing the curriculum, which right. is also very important because you cannot expect every single student to be able to cross borders and experience other cultures and other societies, uh, other languages, but we can do that here through our curriculum. It sounds like U Udo Fluke. We've had Udo on, yeah. on our show talking about uh, various ways that American business people you know, train themselves to go overseas so that they don't offend and that they're able to uh, conduct business without, you know, uh, hurting somebody's feelings or stepping on somebody's, uh, you know, uh, traditions. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you mentioned Udo because Udo is part of my, what I call the Global Century Education Team. And uh, through Global Gateway, which is the program uh, is um, managing uh, now, we go to K-12 to schools here in Missoula, letting kids as young as, you know, four or five years old, uh, know about um, other languages, about other cultures, um, what other people wear, what musical instruments they play in those countries to listen to some of our international students speak in their own language so they can hear the phonetics of different languages, etc. And just, just raising awareness to, you know, the world out there and, and that, in fact, globalization is here and it doesn't have a president or a master. As and, and Paul, share with us how many actual visits have you made? Because what you told me is pretty impressive in terms of the last just year to two years. Global Gateway, I mean, the, the K-12 to branch of Global Gateway started in the spring of uh, 14. And uh, we, we, went to, we had four schools who signed up for that first semester and we gave 70 seminars, 70 what we call global competence seminars in wow. one semester. Wow. And in the two, so in, during the past academic year, in two semesters, we went so from, from 70 seminars in one semester, we went to 360 in two semesters with 11 schools. And just so everybody knows, they were not handing out UN flags after they made their presentations, okay? And so if Missoula's worried about indoctrination, this is no. just not even close to reality. I've been oh. there, I've seen this. They, they do a masterful job of uh, bringing this kind of awareness and education. And they, we didn't go to a single school asking them to do this. Uh -huh. We it's, had schools asking us to do It sounds this. delightful. Just as, as a, like a lot of fun for the kids. It is, and we, we get, you know, such amazing feedback from five-year-olds, eight-year-olds, <laughs> ten-year-olds, sure. and obviously also high school right. students. I got two questions. One's for Paulo. Um, when you work at the University of Montana with the students there and you look at what your daughter went through trying to um, port her degree over to the United States and the difficulties there, how difficult is it to go overseas for an American with a degree from the University of Montana and get work? I personally did not graduate from the UM, but I found it very easy to get work overseas when I wanted to. Is that something that you find, that this difficulty is a one-way street? Um, no, it's not a one-way street. I think uh, professions, um, as I said before, protect themselves everywhere. It's one of those global issues we talk about. Um, and so you always have a very protective uh, environment in terms of accepting more professionals, especially from universities outside a given country. Uh, there is... Um, it's not very difficult to transfer uh, academic credentials between universities, but it is difficult, or be even between uh, K to 12 systems, but it is difficult to uh, transfer professional uh, certification or professional credentials between um, different uh, workplaces. Gotcha. If, if I might give one example, my, my daughter is a registered nurse in Seattle at Seattle Children's Hospital. 
she is now going to be, she is qualified for the uh, traveling nurse program. She's traveling to London to work at a brand new hospital there. And uh, she just got her, her, her permission and she's ready to go. And she's really excited. But one thing she had to do before she got that, she had to pass an English test. <laughs> I would require every American to do that before I send them to England. <laughs> when you think you've heard just about everything, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's that, true. There, there are various uh, medical spellings that are different mm-hmm. in, in 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 the in Great Britain than there are in this country. Say aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, my go. second question is for Patty. Now, Patty, uh, I'm curious. Does ACE have any policy suggestions? Now, these don't have to be federal. They can be federal, state, or policies just on campuses. Policy changes that you would recommend that are adopted to improve the system in the United States. What's What are some of the things that you guys are pushing for? Well, um, again, we would need a, a quite a long time, but I could just maybe point out some highlights. Um, ACE... Uh, tries to be a good citizen, but when we see things that just don't make sense, we try to also advocate for some space for higher education. For example, um, the rating system that was uh, recommended by the um, uh, the White House on um, employment, you know, you would have a uh, how many? How quickly did you graduate? What? What? How quickly did you get a job? And what is your income? And we thought that was kind of um, uh, giving a surgeon a hatchet as opposed to a scalpel uh, to do his or her work. Um, With this in mind, let's take one of the uh, items, uh, just uh, gainful employment. Uh, Of course, we want our students to have jobs. We want them to be able to knock on their heads and find someone at home as well. Um, But um, with regard to jobs, if someone took my first job – when I came out of university and used that as a bellwether for whether the university had educated me well, probably the university would, because it was a very low paying, uh, I was, you know, a, a, a social science major. I wasn't an engineer. Uh, but, you know, I made my way in life and uh, created my pathways, as we all do. And so what we were saying is, look, of course, higher education needs to be held accountable particularly by its consumers, students and their families. And we need to be transparent. We need to talk about graduation rates. Uh, How many students do we take in? How many graduate? How long uh, does it take them? On the other hand, we want to be very careful about these very simplistic measures, such as uh, what what do you make when you uh, immediately graduate from college or university? Life is a journey, not a destination. And we think that your first job is not your last job. And if anything we're, we're hearing in this global economy is that because of globalization, our jobs will change a lot in our lifetimes because the very uh, work that we do will be eroding underneath us because uh, technology is coming on board, uh, other forms of doing it more efficiently. So uh, what I heard uh, in this conference that we uh, just had was – two kinds of skills. One, the skill to do the job, whatever it is. You guys are in radio. You're, you're, you're doing everything. No you, yeah, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you're doing, but, and so you, you, we need to educate for not just specialty, which may be important in a number of uh, jobs, but also agility. Um, you got to be able to move. Uh, and, be nimble. <laughs> and and to, to think through things and as the industry changes, you change and, and your skills change. So I, I think it's that kind of thing where, where we want to have ACE it acts as an intermediary to have that kind of conversation with the government. That's just an example. Yeah, we do have a caller. If you want to strap on those headphones, uh, Paulo, go ahead. Dave, you're on Talkback. Hi, go ahead. Yes, good morning. I hear all the time about uh, world economy and everything is cheaper overseas and maybe even education might be. Uh, but I was wondering, what, what would you think about world labor unions? I realize it's controversial, but I'm curious to know what you'd think about. Is, is there any particular industry you have in mind? Are you talking about education or mining, or what, what do you well, think? I mean, what's the, I mean if, it, if you're dealing with corporations and you know, even universities, uh, they're, they're selling a service. Um, what if 
you know, what, you know, why should people who live outside this country make less wages than us? Why not have world labor unions for anyone and anywhere in the world? Okay. Well, Dave, and we'll see if they can tackle that question. Sure. Thanks for your call. All right. So, <laughs> Paulo, you got the microphone. So, uh, what do you think? Dave, thanks for your question. Easy question, by the way. Um, well, if you'd have to manage to manage um, world um, or to manage labor unions uh, at the global level, you'd have to manage economies at the global level, and there are states and. Uh, the, the nation state is still the defining structure for um, for um, the law, and the law is um, what um, what sets the rules for the um, for the different labor unions. So you'd have to have almost global laws, global labor laws, to be able to then define how a global labor union would would act. So. Um, I it's, think we're sounds think a little spooky to me. I don't know. But, yeah, I was going to say Soviet. I, I was going to say we're we're uh, a long ways from that, but I'm not even sure if we should head in that direction. <laughs> and uh, Dave, just a little insight. I I would shudder to think we'd have a global union, but uh, a lot of corporations are actually forming in compliance with some standards and official and non-official standards forms of doing business. So that if you're going to work in Indonesia or Malaysia or something, you may not agree that this is an area that you will do business in unless certain standards in terms of wages, working conditions, and such are met. So this is already happening on a very informal and, in many cases, formalized way in the private sector. And also, um, universities play a part in the way they educate um, our society in terms of... Um, how to deal with these questions, you know, how to deal with the questions that I think Dave was concerned with when he asked this question. The rights of workers, the conditions, uh, the working conditions everywhere. And that's one thing we can do. And that's one thing universities all over the world are doing, I think. And uh, um, the globalization of um, uh, even educational standards, I right. think, has uh, contributed to that. And we are doing that. We're ed educating people to uh, pay attention to the exact concerns uh, uh, Dave just voiced. Carl's been waiting very patiently. Carl, you're on with Patty McGill Peterson and Paolo Zagallo Mello. Hi. Hey, I have a question. Yes. I, I work, I was a chemist. I'm retired now. And one of the problems I have, I managed 21 chemists in a chemical information firm. We would look at chemical data worldwide from journals and patents. And one of the problems I had was the chemists, most of them were all well-versed in the chemistry that, that, that they were working with, you know, with different areas of chemistry. But one of the problems I had was trying to get people to convey information by written word or giving classes to other people to indicate how we should do things. And, 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 and some of these people were from some of the best universities in this country, and even foreign universities. Obviously, we had to hire people with language skills as well. So... Uh, I was wondering if that still exists, with some of the colleges do not educate people so that they communicate, can communicate by word and by mouth well enough to convey ideas. That's a very good question. So go ahead, Patty. What do you think? Thanks for your call, Carl. Uh, Carl, you've raised something that's um, extremely important, and uh, it actually relates a little bit to some of the conversations we've just been having at this conference at uh, the University of Montana. Uh, one, we talked about global education, but we also talked about something called general education. Uh, and part of that discussion relates to your question, Carl. It's the whole idea of no matter what you major in, if you're a chemist, you're a major in chemistry, what other qualities, educational attributes should you have by virtue of your university education. This was a very important part of the discussion we recently had. And the vote is to create a situation where you don't have people who can't read, can't write, and have a university degree. And this was, this, this is, you know, it has something to do with specialization where we say, oh, you're mainly a chemist and let's just make you the best chemist in the world. And of course, that's a, a wonderful goal. But if you can't communicate, you can't think about how chemistry relates to other things, you can't um, do a, uh, a good letter that describes your research to someone else, then 
this is really a bad situation. And so one of the things that is very much part of the work, I think, of not only your university here in Missoula, but also many colleges and universities, is to go back to first principles and to make sure that no matter what you major in, you have certain attributes as an educated person, which includes some of the very things, the skills that you mentioned, such as being able to communicate well, to write well, to be able to explain what you're doing to the non-specialist. Those are uh, things that every uh, college or university graduate wants to have. Well, right now, most universities attain that through remedial classes or by requiring certain things in your uh, cadre of classes you need before you graduate. Are there things that you recommend that schools should do to make sure that they've met these requirements? Uh, remediation uh, implies something else to me. It re- implies that you didn't uh, get your skills in high school. But if we're talking about gen ed, the answer is really no. Not every college or university does a good job. Sometimes it's you pick a course here, you pick a course there, and that's gen ed. And so it d- wouldn't necessarily cover the areas that uh, Carl is talking about. Not everybody is required to take a writing course. Not everybody is required to take a course on communication or, you know, how do you communicate what you're doing or critically examine what you're doing. One of the things we're finding is with this incredible barrage of information we have, online, on air, whatever, is that the, the danger is that you believe everything you hear or you see and you so can't filter helping, it. there's no filter exactly right. uh, creating this uh, a kind of educational sequence that helps students look at a lot of information a lot of data sift through it and then come to an evidenced based opinion and so I think there's a lot of room to improve gen ed and I believe that you're going to see a lot more activity around this kind of uh, thing and I want to share with you uh, just a, a quick story there's a young man I know who graduated with a degree in English and linguistics. And in watching the graduation ceremony, many of the parents were sitting there wondering, what kind of job are these guys going to get? The professor made the point, and I can validate this from talking to businesses, the lack of ability to write and communicate has become a crisis in the business community in terms of students. This young man went on to grad school, and his weakness was in foreign affairs in terms of that type of exposure. But in grad school, they write papers all day long. His skill set in writing and communication then far exceeded his peers. Of course, he had to catch up on some of the other parts of his work. But this is a real issue as you move up the chain of higher education. Okay, let's continue on. Let's get another call in before we have to take a break in about two minutes. So, Tyler, you're on. Go ahead, sir. Hey. So, last night, my wife and I were um, listening to the radio. We had Herman Cain on, and he was speaking at the university. And he was talking to these young people and telling them how important education was. And, and then he said uh, he linked education to uh, elections and politics and all that. And he said that, look, right now, the smart people outweigh, outnumber the stupid people, i.e. the uneducated, uninformed voter. And my wife and I looked at each other and we laughed because I don't believe that's true anymore. Um, and neither does she. Well, well he was speaking just, on a university campus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we were both just shaking our heads because um, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie um, Idiocracy. Have you seen it? No. No. John? Have you seen Idiocracy, John? Yeah, yeah. John, John Yes, yes. He, he doesn't have his headphones on. Go ahead, Tyler. Okay. So... Uh, it, it's basically a movie that takes place 2,000 years in the future where a guy gets time frozen in time and uh, and then released 2,000 years later on accident, and the entire world has changed. And all the dumb people run the world now. Yeah, because the dumb just, people procreated and the smart people waited till after their degrees in businesses and tried to procreate right. but couldn't. Right. So uh, the world declined and everyone drinks Gatorade, waters their plants with Gatorade, basically, and the world's yeah. gone to heck. Yeah. Yes. So if you haven't seen the movie, watch it, because I believe that's where we're at now. Um, it's a very scary time out there, and, you know, uh, I just I really hope that people can get their, their minds straight and, and learn how to write and communicate and put forth ideas that move this country in the right direction. Well put, Tyler. Thanks for the call. In terms of, this is both for Paolo and for Patty, in terms of critical thinking, something you mentioned, 
Um, it's, uh, the day doesn't pass that you can't find an article about somebody or some organization on campus that's trying to stifle somebody else's thought if it's, the not, if it's not the right type of thinking in terms of politically, socially, women's issues, whatever the case may be. Is this something that we should be concerned about uh, from the standpoint, is it really just a minority that tends to happen in certain parts of the country on campuses, or is this growing across the country to your point that we need to be able to disseminate vast amounts of information, and if we can't have discussion and dialogue, we can't do that? That's a great question, Bob. I think that one of the things we have to defend in universities is it is a place for debate. It's a place for difference of opinion. And when I watch students learn, I think they learn best when they see different opinions, different perspectives, different ways to look at the world. Um, that's the tension that learning requires. It's got to be a civil debate, though, right? Yeah, it, that's exactly it. Right. Exactly. If you have someone coming to campus who is not just expressing a point of view, but is uh, recommending violence. Yeah, like a flamethrower. Really thing. recommending yeah. violence. I, when I was a president, I had a situation like that, that uh, the group that was coming was recommending and violence. And I think there you do have to draw. Can they have an opinion, even about slavery? But if there's something that goes along with it that is violent, then it's it's a problem. So... My sense is that we are I'm, – I'm amazed when students hear really bad ideas how great they are at standing up. Um, I, I actually did have a speaker once on a campus who said slavery is a good thing. And, and I said – and I was, it was recommended that I keep them off campus. I said, no, I have faith mm -hmm. that our students – will stand up and say, and it, it, that's exactly what happened. There's, I think one of the things we have to worry about, though, is now with things like Yik Yak and other uh, forms of anonymous social media, um, there's some really bad stuff out there, particularly yeah. on issues of sexual assault, right. uh, where you have a non anonymity and you have a large message going out to a lot of folks. There, that disturbs me a lot. Uh, I think we need to be very, very careful. And it's, it's about responsibility that we all take for civil society. I think that discretion starts at home. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get Mary on the line. Mary, you are on TalkBack. Hi. Okay, hi. <clears throat> um, I want to take a little bit different approach, having um, observed higher education for quite a few years. Um, I had the privilege of working with um, a physicist, and uh, in this university, I also want to say that people with PhDs who were teaching the students were also having to take training on how to write their papers in English. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think writing is important, no question. But I also want to emphasize about physical dexterity, because this professor of physics, when he brought in his postdocs, he said, I want them to learn how to make their own um, uh, hourglass-type instruments, They're blow their own glass, in other words, in the laboratory, because he wanted them to know how to do hands-on things. He didn't just want them to have theoretical knowledge. And, um, and in keeping with that, Herman Cain's story is interesting because he had physical dexterity to do this neurosurgery work that he did. And my uh, brother Herm, does Herman, metal actually, manufacturing, and he... Her, Herman Cain's the guy that owns the pizza graduate. company. <laughs> I think you're, you're thinking of Ben Carson, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, my point is, is that there's more to education than promoting all these acronyms of ACE and ETS and HIC, whatever all those thousands of acronyms are that are in education. And uh, we're not doing a good job on helping our young men into the workforce. If you've ever seen capable carpenters and plumbers, you know that there's lots of jobs for people who have skills. Yeah, exactly. Our higher education doesn't even deal with that, okay. period. Mary, okay. th th thanks for the call. Any, any comments, Patty? Well, my, uh, I had uh, uncles who were carpenters. And they didn't go to college, and they did a, a fine job with their lives. So I'm not sure 
that we always have to go to university. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity, and those who want to go should go. But, you know, um, I've had in my family, I'm the first uh, person in my family to go on to higher education. I have truck drivers in my family. I have um, carpenters in my family. And they didn't go to higher education, and they had good lives and different lives. But uh, we don't all have to follow the same path. Okay, let's get Matt on the line. Matt, you're on TalkPack. Go ahead. Yeah, speaking of uh, writing and learning to write well, I uh, attended the welding program at the uh, College of Technology and uh, also the culinary arts uh, program uh, before that. So you're cooking with gas. Sorry. Couldn't help myself. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, both cages. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. Go ahead. But uh, one of the hardest classes I took, and I was fairly smart guy. I'm not the dimmest bulb in the string, but um, one of the hardest classes was technical writing, and we had to be able to write, describing, and this is for for culinary arts, you had to be able to write a paragraph describing a procedure in absolutely perfect English, not one comma out of place. Now, this seems a little useless to someone who's, who's learning to cook, but then you, you, you go to, well, okay, now this has to be translated into French, German, Korean, Chinese, and Russian. And if it's not perfect English, it doesn't translate at all. And that was, that was of course, the, the, the raison d'etre, uh, the reason for existing for, the, for that course. And it was, I found it very, very valuable uh, as, as a tool throughout life. You wanted to address something that Matt said, Patty. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to do a shout-out for Matt. Uh, Matt, first of all, you sound like an interesting person that you did welding and culinary arts. And uh, also, uh, this is, you know, I, I learned a little bit about the school you went to, and I think it's a great school. Um, you know, you, you make a, the point so well that, yes, yeah, you learned some skills, and uh, but you also learned some general skills. You're going to apply that technical writing uh, that perfection that you had to g- engage in to, to describe your process of culinary uh, uh, creation, uh, that's going to serve you in so many other ways. And so thanks for that. I, that was a great example. And, and, you know, if Matt has children, or one day does, the fact of what he has learned, he will pass on to his children. So we don't even realize that what we're doing for ourselves is really generational in terms of helping that next unborn or here. Well, that's, that's, that's the core of education. Yes. No, yes. Go ahead. I'd just like to add to, um, regarding Matt's question, that that shows how important the concept of general education or foundational, a foundational education is. Even when you're looking at a specific type of training for a specific profession, uh, like culinary arts or welding, you do need this broader uh, sense of uh, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and 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 to bring these other skills that apparently uh, have served uh, Matt very well. And we do have um, these are two of the uh, star programs actually at the Missoula College, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and I was so happy that Matt called and, and mentioned both. And and just to know that he actually took both programs is yeah very interesting. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. I just, and continuing this, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left here. I'd ask you this off air for both of you. What, um, if you've learned one thing in all the years of doing this, is, is there some kind of general message that you've seen has consistently worked in regards to education? Now, with all the different variables that you can say, look, guys, whatever else you do, please make sure that this is a part of your curriculum, your thinking, and your standards. I think of the old adage, um, do you give a man or woman a fish or do you teach him or her how to fish? And maybe we're talking about both here, and Matt's maybe a good example. Um, Yes, we can't uh, do a Marie Antoinette and say let them eat cake. People need jobs. They need to bring home some uh, money to put food on the table and to uh, clothe people and uh, shelter people and the basics. So we can't Various levels and forms of higher education has to pay attention to the immediate. But we also need to take the longer view, and that view is to give our students, no matter what they study, 
whether it's welding or philosophy, a set of skills and thought processes that take them over the course of their life to many different jobs, and we know that's part of globalization. There are going to be many, many different kinds of jobs that people hold, but also about the quality of their lives. It's not just about job, but, you know, I, I used to like to say when I would talk with students at the institutions where I was president, my best hope for you is that you can knock on your own head and find someone at home. <laughs> um, and so it's all of those goals, and uh, I think that's the core of what we should be doing in higher education. Paul, go ahead. The, one of the strengths of uh, an education that has a general education component or a foundational education component um, is that it teaches you how to think, so you learn how to think, and you learn how to learn, because you learn different things following different methodologies. Uh, and if you have, for instance, I come from a country and a region, you know, in Europe, where you, if you're taking a biology degree, that's all you're going to get. You're going to get biology-related courses from day one until uh, your graduation. And if you're studying political science, that's all you're going to get. It's all, all going to be political science. And I value the uh, general education that we have as a component of our uh, college education in the U.S. because even if you're studying biology or physics or chemistry uh, or uh, sociology, you in the first two years or you know throughout the degree, in fact, not only in some models, not only in the first two years, but you, you can also study music and you can also study, um, if you're studying biology, you can also study um, chemistry or politics or, and, and you get a broad sense of um, how things work. And also, you get a very, you, you learn how to study. If you take a course in history, you're going to learn how to study history, which is completely different from learning how to study chemistry. And, and you, you compile these different methodologies that then are going to be very useful throughout your life. And uh, so I think we we'll learn how to think and we we'll learn how to learn. And those are two most fundamental uh, strengths of a general education. In the minute and a half we have left, Patty, if you wouldn't mind grabbing the microphone, I, I, I would like to ask you your impression of the University of Montana, of Missoula, aside from, you know, the, the, the ice cream. <laughs> but but, but, but your, your view of the University of Montana, how it's put together, the, the, uh, the folks who are in charge, and, and the way that they've administered the university, from your view. Wow. Um, in uh, 30 seconds, one, right? One, one, we're down to about one minute. So. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, first of all, I'm, I think this has got to be one of the friendliest universities I've ever been at. I, everybody says hello, no matter what. Um, but there is a buzz about the place that I think is very heartening. Um, my view is a limited one in that I've just been at this conference. But this conference was the uh, came brought people together from every part of the university, brought administrators, faculty, staff, students. And that to me says that uh, there is a view that this is a commu education is a community process, but but there's leadership for it. Uh, Royce Engstrom uh, really did think that this idea of examining general education, looking at global learning, uh, thinking about the workforce and innovation. These were things that I think are kind of core to what the university is thinking about in terms of all of its programming, and it was beautifully brought together. Thank you so much, both of you, for being with us. Bob, thank you for bringing these wonderful guests. We appreciate it. We'll do it again. And that's uh, the Montana World Affairs Council on the radio. Have a great day.